The small islands scattered across the Pacific Ocean enjoy a great cultural richness, but many of its people endure a daily struggle to sustain their livelihoods. Nearly a third of its 10 million inhabitants lack access to basic human needs such as clean water, sanitation and health care. Because of their limited land resources, many Pacific Island nations have become dependent on foreign aid to support their fragile livelihoods and basic services. Some of the larger island countries such as Papua New Guinea, Fiji and the Solomon Islands have attempted to exploit resources such as forestry and minerals in an effort to develop their economic independence. Other Pacific Island countries have worked to exploit the commercial tuna fishing stocks that exist within the exclusive economic zones. But sadly, most of the benefits from the exploitation of these resources have had limited success in supporting the sustainable economic development of struggling Pacific Island nations. Now, many island nations are eagerly eyeing up the potential economic benefits from valuable deep-sea mineral resources that have been discovered within their extensive maritime territories. In recent years, the rising global demand for metals, combined with advances in deep-sea mining technology, have spurred a rush of commercial interest in the potential profits to be gleaned from the depths of the ocean floor. The small developing island countries located along the Pacific Rim of Fire have suddenly become the global pioneers in a race to harvest these valuable mineral resources. But these countries have also become the center of a heated debate over whether the economic benefits for Pacific Islanders will outweigh the environmental risks of harvesting these precious metals from the bottom of the sea. It's a blessing. It's a blessing for the people of Tonga to, to have that. See, we were never colonized and no one developed us. It was ourselves from the beginning. And now we have donor partners helping us and uh, we don't want that to continue. We want to, to do things ourselves. And with the deep sea minerals, that's a blessing for us. How uh, urgent is the need to mine? It's only to uh, make uh, mobile phones, rockets to the moon, all those uh, uh, fighting weapons so they can go and kill each other in other countries. Not, not here in Papua New Guinea. Is it important now? The answer to that question is yes, it is important now because multinationals are not going to wait to give Pacific Island countries time to look at all the studies, environmental analysis before they come in. They are pushing and there is only a limit to which some countries will be able to withstand that because they got the technological knowledge. Many countries uh, will not. Look at Papua New Guinea, it's not even 10 to 15 years. We're rushing the process. What's the rush? Papua New Guineans are not on life support. And I'm sure Pacific Islanders are not, not on life support. We've been living on our land and off our sea for ages. We can't die if our marine resources are not being exploited. We still live on fish. We still live on our garden produce. So who is actually the one who's going to suffer? I think it's the miners, not the resource owners, not Papua New Guineans, not Tongans, not Fijians. The ideal situation will be to have all the assessments completed and then see what the best option is. That is the ideal, and for us it is also the ideal. But we are not in an ideal world. And right now the pressures on governments is driven by economic instability. Um, many governments in the Pacific have a huge problem forecasting economic growth. This is a resource that they see that it ca they can benefit from. Uh, and therefore, 
I think we need to move out of the ideal zone. It's not practical, it's not realistic. We need to move into the practical zone and ask the question, what is the best combination of options we need to look at? People are, are afraid of the dark. It's a case of, um, in the absence of knowledge, they, they, their default reaction is to be conservative and worried. And that's probably a, a, a well-learned habit <laughs> over time. And so what we've got to do is shine light into those dark corners and explain what we're doing and show that there is nothing to fear when you switch the light on. I think uh, Deep Sea Minerals is in a much better uh, place uh, at the moment. Eh? You know, nothing has started, but you know, the way that we are preparing for it, you know, we have so many meetings, the EU, you know, pouring this funding, even before any mining has started. I think that's a good thing, eh? as compared to land based. I think this uh, scenario didn't, have, didn't occur in land based. This is probably why we have a lot of uh, environmental issues on land based uh, uh, mining. Eh? As even in the region, eh? in uh, some cases in some island countries, even you know environment management is a relatively new thing, you know, to the to the land base. Eh? But you see now, I think with this um, cautious uh, precautionary approach that we are taking, you know, even before anything has started, we are beginning to to fight the good fight. Eh? <laughs> Let's put it way. Currently in the Pacific, the most commercially viable mineral deposits are called seafloor massive sulfides. These deposits are formed by hydrothermal vents sometimes referred to as black smokers. These high pressure superheated fluids escape through cracks in the earth's surface and mix with cold seawater at depths of 400 to 5000 meters. When this happens, the minerals that are formed and fall to the sea floor include high concentrations of metals such as copper, gold, silver, zinc and lead. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States estimates the world's deep sea vent systems could contain up to 4 kilograms of mineable gold for every person on Earth. Commercial interest has focused on seafloor massive sulfides because of their high concentration of metals and the discovery of accessible sites in relatively shallower depths of around 1500 to 3000 meters. Mining seafloor massive sulfides also focuses on relatively small areas of the seabed with a portable harvesting system that can be moved from one site to another in a matter of days. The Canadian company Nautilus Minerals was granted with a first offshore exploration license in Papua New Guinea in 1997. In January 2011, the PNG government granted Nautilus a 20-year license to mine a site in the Bismarck Sea, 30 kilometers off the coast of New Island. But a dispute with the government has suspended the company's plans to use underwater robotic technology to extract up to 1.3 million tons of ore containing minerals per year from their site known as Solwara 1. We feel that the process of issuing mining license to deep sea mining was, was rushed. Uh, there was not enough consultation with all stakeholders uh, lack of information to, to uh, the resource owners, to Papua New Guineans at large. Uh, and when you leave people in darkness, you know, people are afraid. Uh, people's livelihood depends on marine resources. And the people of Bismarck Solomon Seas do not want to be exploited at the whims of their ignorance. That's why we have this body that becomes the voice of the voiceless majority of the people of the Bismarck Solomon Seas. We want to be their ears, their eyes, their mouth. Nautilus believes a large part of the problem they face is the public's negative association with on-land mining practices. Mining does bring connotations of things that we just don't do and can't do. Uh, mining, often people think of big holes in the ground with blasting as a mining activity. Well, we don't do that and can't do that. Um, we're not tunneling or undermining or anything like that. So we are a, a relatively different sort of activity. What I believe is the intrinsic value in this project 
to the environment and the communities. It's got a small footprint. And to me, this is the key thing. Whichever way you look at it, it's got a small footprint. We're only going to affect a few football fields a year in terms of the area on the seafloor we're disaggregating. Um, that area itself is a very um, geologically dynamic environment. It's, it, 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 it will restore itself very quickly. Um, we've, we, we're putting that up as a hypothesis, and Sawara One will demonstrate that, we believe. Um, I've got examples where the seafloor is recovered in two years just from a small activity, and there's no reason to think it's not going to be like that on a bigger scale. The floor of the deep ocean was once believed to be as unknowable as the distant planets of the solar system. Scientists only proved the existence of hydrothermal vents in 1977, but now deposits of seafloor massive sulfides have been found in the territorial waters of Papua New Guinea, Tonga, Fiji, the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. Marine scientists are only starting to learn about the newly discovered organisms that depend on hydrothermal vents for life. Some fear that deep sea mining activities could cause lasting and irreparable damage to these unique habitats before we develop any detailed understanding of these new species. There's never been a deep sea mining occurring in anywhere in the world from that to depth. 5,000 meters deep. So theory is one thing, actually doing it and uh, experiencing the impact of that is another thing. So I'm not going to buy in, into what Nautilus has said, because like all miners, they have to come up with something to convince the government of the day to, to uh, give them the uh, license to, to mine the Solvara. So at, at this stage, we'd rather say that let them go and do it in Canada first or let them go and do it in the US or elsewhere, but not in, in Papua New Guinea. It can be done well, and the operators that are committed to doing it well should um, be given the opportunity and the advantage over those that don't. And that's, like I said before, Nautilus is working really hard to set a very high standard for the whole industry following us. We're not just a startup company, we're also the industry leader, and we take that very seriously. And so as the fast followers come in behind us, we, we're hoping that they will be kept to the high, same high standard that we are. Otherwise, um, this opportunity for trade and for benefit of mankind um, might be lost for another generation. The discovery of more seafloor massive sulphide deposits in the waters of Papua New Guinea and Tonga have led to a rush for applications within other countries' maritime zones. Over 300 exploration licenses have been granted within national jurisdictions of a number of Pacific Island countries such as Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. If metal prices continue to rise, countries like the Cook Islands are likely to become involved in the extraction of manganese nodules, which are seen as more challenging to harvest. Throughout the Pacific region, civil society organizations are asking tough questions about what steps their governments are taking to ensure these important deep sea mineral resources are managed in the most environmentally and socially responsible way. We need uh, to develop our, our economy so that our people can benefit. Will, they, will the NGOs feed our people? I say no, they do nothing. All they do is to complain and say this is bad and this is bad, doing nothing about it. It's a waste of time. We cannot just wait and hang it out there while our people need education. Well, our people need this. This needs development. They need good roads to take them to their plantations. We cannot just wait and hang out there and wait for the NGOs to tell us when. No, we have to do our due diligence and work for our people. I think we are much more inclusive now in the involvement of NGOs. Uh, even uh, for me, uh, you know, uh, there has been a lot of uh, mineral and mining activity in Fiji, but we haven't witnessed the, the level of uh, 
of participation by non-government organizations eh, and civil societies. Uh, even though it may be a bit irritating to us, but I, overall I think it's a good thing. Eh? You know, uh, every peop, uh, society's or community's uh, view is to be taken into account. Eh? Most Pacific Island countries lack the policies, regulations and capacity needed to ensure that their deep sea mineral resources are managed in a responsible manner. Currently, there are few formal measures in force to safeguard national economic interests or to protect their marine environments and natural resources. Because of their concerns about the rapid increase in commercial interest, the Pacific Island countries turned to SOPAC, the Applied Geoscience and Technology Division of the Secretariat of the Pacific Community. In 2011, SOPAC started the four-year Pacific Deep Sea Minerals Project with funding from the European Union. This project is designed to strengthen the capacity of Pacific ACP states to improve the governance and management of their deep sea mineral resources. The project recommends that Pacific Island countries prioritize the development of national policies and laws before any mining is contemplated. The project is working to help Pacific Island countries build effective legal frameworks increase technical capacity, develop effective environmental management systems and increase greater public engagement on the issues surrounding the governance of deep sea mineral resources. And the deep sea mineral project feels part of the void, it's part of the answer. It is not saying go and do mining, it is saying should you decide to go and do mining, please these are the areas you need to consider. SPC is about providing the right information to the countries. The decision to mine or not is not SPC's. The decision to mine is the countries. It is their resource. Our interest is that before they make the decision, they must have the information that tells them of the benefits as well as the consequences. The Pacific Deep Sea Minerals Project also realized that island countries needed to be armed with the critical negotiating skills needed to be able to deal effectively with the well-resourced deep sea mining companies entering the region. So I think it's very, very important that if a country does go down the path of, of uh, mining, firstly they need to understand that the companies who are going to mine are going to make heavy investments in order to do that. And because they make heavy investments, they're going to push very, very hard to get as much of the proceeds as possible. Ten years is too far. We don't know what will happen in ten years' time. Let's try and do what we can do now. And let's have uh, the benefits of it for the people now. Well, we, we can only... A country needs people and people have needs and that is what we should do we should work on it and try and do something instead of just hanging there and doing nothing if we can do it before 10 years i guarantee we will do it and we can do it no one is stopping us papua new guinea you know they say we are island of gold floating on oil but look at the mortality rate literacy rate the infrastructure, no way. We are no way better than Fiji. So these are lessons that must be learned by our neighboring Pacific Island countries. You must not make haste because mining will not make a big impact. Even though they say mining is the bigger um, uh, uh, contributor of PNG's economy, the, the fact of the matter is that they give us one million kina, they take 200 million US dollar out of the country. That's why our GDP is very low. So these lessons must be learned. Governments are usually put in the position of, well, if they don't do it, we get nothing anyway. Um, therefore, we'll go along because we get something. 
I think governments need to move away from that and actually put up a fairly strategic defense that they are going to be some things not negotiable. For instance, benefit sharing, you're interested in my resource, this is the minimum we're getting out of it. If you're not interested in that partnership, thank you very much, but we're not interested in you. I think the key message is how do we uh, sustain economic growth? Firstly, governments need to be very clear on what is it that they want to get out of this. They have to have fairly definite milestones that are not negotiable and use that as a negotiating basis because there are many companies out there. And governments should not look at the very first one that offers to invest. They should actually be looking at it from the perspective of what is the best deal for my country that gave me A, the resources at the level I need, and B, that have the resource in a way that is environmentally and economically sustainable. Make sure that you get the best out of your negotiation. You don't get half or you don't get less. And that sadly has been going on in Papua New Guinea for the last uh, decades since uh, independence. So I'm, I'm calling on all the Pacific Island countries to learn lessons from Papua New Guinea and do not make hasty decisions to just uh, go ahead and say, okay, uh, kiosk or not to lose or blue waters, you come and, you know, mind the deep flow. No, don't rush. First, you must make sure, you must know what you want, the purpose of you going into that contract agreement. Objective, what do you want to get? How much benefit do you want your country to get? You, uh, you must, because you know that their mining companies are here to make profit. And you must, you are there to represent the welfare of your people, their social needs, their infrastructure needs, their economic needs. You must think of the future generation as well. If you reap all the resources now, what do you have left for the future generation? And the other thing is for us to be able to not only manage the proceeds from the development, but also to be able to use it wisely. Uh, that is always also one of the challenges. Uh, because uh, the, these minerals are finite and, you know, and are non-reliable. So we need to, once we get the proceeds, we need to use it very, very wisely, or maybe reinvest it in such a way that it will sustain a development that after 10 or 20 years that the mining company is gone, we can continue to enjoy the wealth or the, yeah, the benefits from this resource. With regard to the protection of the marine environment... One of the main objectives of the SPC EU Pacific Deep Sea Minerals Project is to help governments work with all project stakeholders to make informed decisions on the management of their deep sea mineral resources. I think this is where I'm saying the preparation is key. We need to up our preparation and be ready once this big mining company is always ready. You know, you know, you know what I'm saying. At, at the moment, um, the rural communities and maybe government lags behind uh, with development. And what I mean is that development happens before we are sort of, sort of ready to sort of uh, join them as partners, as partners in development, meaning partners in the sharing of the benefits. So, but um, most of these companies can start yesterday, if you know what I mean. While, you know, governments not slowly and bureaucratically. It's about building the regulations. And those are so important to make sure that there's no gap in understanding between the, the government who, who desires the outcome that we do, um, the regulator who's enforced with making sure it's done the way it should be done, and ourselves, there's got to be no gap in understanding of expectations. And that's the nature of any good contract between partners, because in its essence, that's what we become. We become a, a local citizen in the place where we're operating, and we're a partner with the government and the local stakeholders. We would like to talk and negotiate with them on a level playing field. Uh, and with that, uh, I, th I thank uh, SOPEC and EU for funding this workshop here in Tonga. We, we all, all of us in the Pacific, need to come to terms with that and uh, we need to work as a team, work together. <laughs>